We're now going to deepen our coverage of Java's declarative programming paradigm by focusing on its key functional programming concepts and features. These features and concepts were added in Java 8, which came out in 2014 and have been elaborated and expanded upon in all the other releases since then. We'll also talk about how to compare and contrast functional programming and object-oriented programming to see how they can each be used synergistically to solve more interesting problems together. Functional programming has its roots in a formalism known as lambda calculus. In lambda calculus, computations are treated as the evaluation of mathematical functions, where you can take the input to a function, it does some computation, and it, go ahead, it goes ahead and produces an output. Ideally, each function is so-called pure, which means it has no side effects on memory or IO, but instead only works on the input parameters that are passed to it, and then has output parameters, either through a return value or through some other means provided through the parameter list that will give the results back to the caller. One thing you can do, of course, with functions that are especially pure functions is you can compose them together in so-called functional composition, where the output of one function serves as the input to the next function in the pipeline, or sometimes called chain. Let's take a quick look at an example of how we could do this approach to compute the nth factorial in parallel using some cool features in modern Java, including functional programming features, as well as its more advanced stream features. This particular function, of course, takes the value n, which is what we're trying to compute the factorial for. We'll walk through an example using a very simple illustration of input where we're going to take uh, the computation of n, where n is 8. So you would start out here by saying long stream dot range closed. And what that does is that generates a stream of long values from 1 to n in parallel, where n is 8. And I've shown you how it looks in the diagram on top. It's kind of a tree of values that are split up until we have just fundamental values that can be evaluated pairwise. What we do, do then is we perform something called a reduction, which is a classic functional programming method, which goes ahead and processes, processes a bunch of computations in parallel. So what it basically does here is it multiplies values pairwise in parallel. So of course, it'll multiply one by two, which yields two, three by four, which yields 12, five by six, which yields 30, and seven by eight, which is 56. All those computations each run sequentially, but they all run together in parallel, if that makes sense. And then as part of the reduction process, reduce will end up successively combining so-called immutable values, which means they can't be changed after they're set, and they'll produce a new immutable value. So two will be multiplied by 12 to yield 24, 30 will be multiplied by 56 to yield 1,680, and then finally, 24 will be multiplied by 1,680 to yield 40,320. All of that, of course, takes place in parallel, so it's very fast. But you can also see how we're computing the values by chaining them together using the fluent programming style. That's something we talked about earlier. One of the key properties or themes in a functional programming environment, functional programming language, functional programming ecosystem, is to avoid changing state and also avoiding mutable shared data to avoid various hazards, particularly concurrency hazards. Another way of looking at this is we don't want to have side effects that will cause problems for our analysis and our debugging. So let's take a look at how not to do things. This would be a way not to implement a parallel factorial function where we're going to use shared state. And you can take a look at the code that's shown here in the repository at the bottom of the slide to get access to the code we're going to be talking about. So here's the buggy version, which is also going to take the value n. And the first thing it's going to do, which is really what gets us into trouble, is it's going to make a new shared object, which is an instance of class total. And if you look at class total, you can see it has a field called m total that's initialized to one, and it has a method called malt, which multiplies m total by n. In a sequential program, this wouldn't be a problem. However, we're going to be using this with a parallel program. So once again, we're going to generate n longs using the range closed method, and we're going to run everything in parallel. And for each of the operations we're going to be doing, we're going to be calling the malt method using what's called a method reference. And when all those threads end up calling malt and multiplying m total by n, we're going to end up with something called race conditions, which are problems that occur when a program depends on the proper ordering of threads, 
or operations in order for it to perform correctly. We'll talk a lot more about race conditions and other contexts because they're a real problem in parallel computing. So what's happening here is we have a side effect where M total multiplied by N is done in multiple cores at the same time, and that leads to all kinds of chaos and insanity. There's other subtle problems here having to do with things like inconsistent memory visibility, which just go to show how complicated it is to program concurrent and parallel code without proper support from abstractions like Java parallel streams or completable futures or reactive streams. However, those are more advanced concepts we'll talk about in other contexts. One thing to remember is only you can prevent concurrency hazards. You have to be responsible for making sure there's no synchronization issues, no race conditions, no memory visibility problems. The compiler, the Java virtual machine, the execution environment typically won't save you. So you have to be aware of this stuff. Again, that's, that's a more advanced topic for a later time. So what does functional programming focus on? If it doesn't want to deal with mutable state and sharing and side effects, what is it trying to do affirmatively? Well, basically its focus is on so-called immutable objects. And an immutable object is simply an object whose state can't be changed after the object is constructed. And at first this may sound very mystical and mysterious, but actually it's very simple. And you've probably worked with this quite a bit if you program with Java for any length of time. And that's because the string class in Java is a common example of an immutable object. If you take a look at the string class, you'll see that it has things like constructors that can be used to initialize one string from another or from a, a character uh, array. It has fields like length and so on, but all the fields are final and it only has accessor methods. It has no mutator methods. So once a string is created, its value cannot be changed. You can only say append it or modify it in the sense of getting a substring, which is not modifying the actual string, it's creating a new copy of the substring and so on and so forth. So now that we've talked a little bit about some of the key concepts that underlie functional programming and how it's expressed in Java, let's do a little short comparison and contrast between functional programming and object-oriented programming in Java. So object-oriented programming, as we've alluded to in our earlier lesson on object-oriented key concepts and features, employs something called hierarchical data abstraction, where you have a super class or an abstract class or an interface, like the iterator interface in Java, and then you implement or extend it to provide so-called concrete classes that actually have real state and real computations of which you can make objects of. In general, in an object-oriented program, components are based on so-called stable class roles and relationships that are extensible using inheritance and dynamic binding. Those are the key object-oriented features. In contrast, in a more classic algorithmic design approach, the way the software would be decomposed would be based on actions implemented as functions. So that's not really the preferred object-oriented way of doing things. Also in an object-oriented programming language, state is encapsulated by methods that themselves perform imperative statements. For example, here's an illustration of using the iterator methods has next and next is part of an iterator and visitor pattern combination. And what's interesting about this is that has next and next will actually mutate the state of the object that's being iterated over or the iterator itself rather. And that il illustrates the fact that you can actually make changes to state. And that's pretty much by design in an imperative programming context. So as you can see, when has next is called, when next is called, it'll access and or update the internal iterator state. So that, that's the end of the overview of Java's key functional programming concepts and features. Of course, we will go into much more detail with lots more examples as we work further into the lessons in this material.